Um, it is now my um, uh, honor um, to invite um, Selu Timbu, um, who is the Vice President of Community and Diversity Relations at hy and also an Inclusion Council member of the Greater Des Moines Partnership, um, who will be introducing our first keynote speaker of the day. So, Selu. Hey, thank you, Jay. Hope all you can hear me well and hope everything's going good for everybody. What a great day so far. Um, it was a fantastic CEO uh, roundtable that we just had. So good morning to y'all. I'm excited to be here to be able to visit with you. And it's also my honor to introduce our first keynote speaker for today's event. And what I'm gonna do is moderate the Q&A. So I'm gonna ask you, if you have questions that you'd like to ask, please put them in the Q&A box. We try to get, take as many questions as we can. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Laura Morgan Roberts. She's an innovative global scholar and consultant on the science of maximizing human potential in the diverse organizations and communities. She's published over 50 research articles, teaching cases, and practitioner-oriented tools for strategically activating best selves through strength-based development and workforce equity and inclusion. Dr. Roberts has ed edited three books, Race, Work and Leadership, Positive or Organizing in a Global Society, and Exploring Positive Identities in Organizations, and self-published several poetry collections in the Alignment Quest Toolkit for Activating Best Selves. Dr. Roberts is also a frequent contributor to Harvard Business Review and the Academy of Management Review for influential publications and presentations on diversity, authenticity, and leadership development have been recognized by Thinker50 on the radar uh, in, in 2018 in the Academy of Management. Dr. Roberts is the 2020 inaugural recipient of the Acad Academy of Management Organizational Behavior Award for Society Impact. So she currently serves as professor of practice at her alma mater, University of Virginia, in Darden School of Business. She's earned a BA in, in psychology with highest distinction and, and a Phi Beta Kappa from the University of Virginia and an MA and PhD in organizational psychology from the University of Michigan. She served on facu uh, faculties of Harvard Business School, Georgetown, McDonough School of Business, Antioch University's Graduate School of Leadership and Change. She's also taught organizational behavior, psychology, negotiations, group dynamics, diversity leadership, and career development at the University of Michigan, the Wharton School of Finance, Tuck, Georgia State University, UCLA Anderson, uh, Simmons School of Management, and ATV in Copenhagen, Denmark. Wow, that is amazing. Laura's family roots are in Gary, Indiana and Washington, DC, and she's a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, Inc. Dr. Roberts, with all that, and um, with your background and experience, I can just say it's an honor to have you here with us, and we are excited to hear you speak. With that, here's Dr. Roberts. Thank you so much, Selu. Um, very much appreciate the invitation to be here today um, amongst such esteemed uh, thought leaders and um, business leaders who are all taking up this work at such a critical and important time. Um, I was delighted to receive the invitation. As you heard, uh, I'm a Midwesterner by roots, having grown up in Indiana, in Gary, Indiana. Um, my fa father's side of the family had been in Gary, Indiana for a couple of generations. Uh, my mother's side of the family is from Washington, D.C., um, and my great grandmother was actually born in Charlottesville, Virginia. I um, may get more into that story in our conversation today. But I wanted to mention, um, by way of connection to Iowa, the fact that my father is a graduate of Grinnell College. And not only was he a graduate, an enthusiastic graduate, so was his older cousin. Um, and he has served on the board of Grinnell College. He is now um, rotated off because he served on the board for so many years. Uh, you see, he felt so passionately about the experience that he had had at Grinnell. And um, he works uh, diligently 
in promoting access and equity in education, um, but also in healthcare. Uh, so he is an orthopedic surgeon now in San Francisco, I mean, sorry, in Sarasota, Florida. And um, he is working diligently around uh, health disparities. So these intersections around race, justice, um, education, business, and health have all been quite central to my upbringing, um, have a deep passion and connection around uh, public education and the ways that it can help us to achieve many of the aspirations that we hold for ourselves and for others. So I hope as we engage today, we'll have this conversation from an open systems perspective as we really do think about these intersections as when we're talking about equity and, and structure, um, differences um, and race and racism. Um, it's important to think about the ways in which business leaders interface with other important systems within our society, um, education and healthcare being two important ones. So we may cross-reference that in some of our conversations, but the title of my comments uh, is based on a framework that I'm gonna share with you called the Affirm Framework for Valuing Differences. Um, but my subtext here is seven conversations we should be having but generally aren't about equitable diversity, inclusion, and positive organizing. So let's just come out the gate and talk about um, some of the aversion that people have to this work. Um, you heard in the panel many different examples of the kinds of resistance that people have to the um, types of initiatives that advance equity on uh, inclusion along a number of dimensions. People also have aversion to having the very conversation that our panelists um, engaged in today and the conversations that you'll have throughout the day um, and as you move into your breakout groups. Uh, we simply struggle with um, talking about these topics in ways that are meaningful and help us to catalyze the kinds of institutional and societal changes that we need, um, as well as the personal and individual changes that we need to engage to really move this work forward. So uh, you can see here from my images, for those of you who are looking at to characterize typical conversations around diversity, equity, and inclusion in two buckets. Uh, so one is the, the cotton candy bucket. It's the syrupy sweet conversation that we feel often lacks substance. Um, people like talking about it because uh, it's fun to talk about a lot of differences that we have, but we feel that we're not truly getting to the meat of the issue or the heart of the matter. They're not as nourishing or sustaining. And over time, they may even erode the work, the very work that we're trying to do or undermining it. Um, the other end of the continuum is the Tabasco sauce conversation. It gets really hot, gets really strong. And if you put too much on it um, at the wrong time or for the people who don't have the palate for it, then there's gonna be an aversion that they won't be able to digest what's being shared either. So the seven conversations that I'm offering you today come out of collective work that I've been fortunate to participate in and amplify. I published three edited volumes. These two more recent edited volumes, um, especially Race, Work and Leadership, was just published in 2019, focus on how we value difference. And in that work, we feature over 50 scholars who have all conducted research in this domain. Positive organizing in a global society is a similar compilation. And so what I'll invite you to do today as we take up these three conversations is to acknowledge, acknowledge the role that differences play in our organizations and in our societies. Affirm, affirm the value of difference. And I'll say more about how that is heart work and handwork, handiwork. And then finally, the action component. So here's the Affirm framework. It's, it's motivated by an overarching question that I think is at the core of inclusion, which is how do we activate our best selves? 
You know, it's not just about, you know, letting everybody bring themselves to work or bring their whole selves to work just for the sake of self-expression alone, but it's really trying to tap into the very best of who we are individually and collectively. So how do we bring out the best in ourselves and in others? And what will it take for us to make our best selves even better as we move into this work? Um, here at this time in uh, our country's history and global history. So the AFFIRM framework aligns with um, the letters of FIRM, anticipate valued contributions from diversity. Uh, focus on strengths, and we'll talk about what this means. It's through a, a critical lens. It's an appreciative lens, but it's also a critical lens. It's not all cotton candy and, and syrupy sweet. Um, we've, we're gonna make sure that there's some meat to this conversation as well. Uh, foster conditions for best selves to flourish. How do we need to transform the systems, the practices, the cultures, the very cultures of our organizations so that people from diverse backgrounds can truly bring their best selves to work? Um, it means that the culture needs to be more welcoming and hospitable for everyone. How do we engage in strategic diversity? What does it mean to take up diversity as a strategic imperative? Uh, which was one of the recommendations coming out of that phenomenal panel that just concluded uh, that we need to think about this from a multi-stakeholder perspective. Um, there's a moral case for doing this work. There are also um, other cases around our business imperative for getting it right. And we should be tuned into that and intentional about alignment in those dimensions. Rewrite the script, rewrite the script. So we have these scripts we're talking about and engaging in differences that are based on some long standing assumptions and the power dynamics that they reinforce. We have to rewrite the script in order to do this work differently. And then finally mobilizing our resources. Then we're ready to mobilize our resources. So as I move through the content of the talk, I'm going to actually flip back and forth because I know that Again, these conversations are ones that we tend to avoid. In fact, there's research that shows that people will welcome some certain conversations about diversity and inclusion um, when they feel a little bit more like happy talk. But when they start to get more substantive and meatier and really to push up against some of our assumptions around equality, um, around uh, meritocracy, around inclusion and exclusion, uh, they become a little bit unsettling. They don't always sit as well with us, you know, but one of the ways that we tend to come together and bring and build community is through fellowship. It's through truly sitting down and breaking bread with one another and starting to understand more about people's needs, people's values and priorities, um, people's lived experiences, and so I'm going to offer you a set of conversations that you can activate that all fall under this banner of table talk. You know, imagine those experiences when the quality of the meal is nourishing and sustaining, um, but there's probably also an element of fellowship that you would associate with this question when you think, what is the best meal that you have ever eaten? Part of it is about the food that's served and then part of it is about the atmosphere, okay? So let's think about what it would take for you to, within your organizations, start to generate that same kind of experience of coming to the table together, being able to break bread and take up this difficult and challenging but important work of diversity, equity, and inclusion. When you think of the best meal you've ever had, you know that it did, it's not something that you were able to just grab out of the freezer, pop in the microwave, and then eat on the go, right? Somebody took time. They had a recipe, whether they had written it down or they had memorized it because they had learned it and they breathed it, but they took the time with intention to put certain pieces in place, to get the right ingredients, combine them in the right measure, in the right order, and then serve it in a way that created this phenomenal experience for you. That's how we have to think about our work in advancing equitable diversity and inclusion. 
what is our recipe for success? A great place to start with your recipe for success is to think about the experiences that you personally have had when you felt fully included at school or in work or, um, or in your communities more broadly. Uh, what was happening there? Who was involved? How were you engaged? What was it that made you feel truly included, valued, significant, uh, as a meaningful contributor to whatever was happening within that moment or space. Didn't necessarily mean that you had to be the one running the show um, or that you were the one who was hostessing and taking care of everybody, but wherever you found yourself within that space was one and is a moment in which you felt truly included in school or at work or in your community. What I've been learning in my research and consulting over the past two decades is that when people feel fully included in these systems, it's often because they feel free. And it's not just that they are a part of a system and then they have to be confined or constrained by the limitations that a system and people in power have created within a system. Um, in order to maintain some status hierarchy or dynamic, but they in fact feel free. And here's what we mean by free. We're talking about having equal access to four freedoms at work. First, the freedom to be our authentic self. And so uh, Rosalind and Marv talked about this a lot in terms of assimilation and how people uh, from non-prototypical or lower status or stigmatized backgrounds often have to cover aspects of their identities or work triple time to assimilate into the culture, to demonstrate that they are as much like the people who are accepted and in power um, as they possibly can. And so when you have to do that kind of assimilative work, you're missing out on the freedom to be your authentic self. And the research supports that when people are inauthentic at work, they feel less connected to their work. Um, they are cognitively distracted by this assimilation pressure. They're emotionally burdened or they have an emotional tax um, for feeling this disconnect with their tasks and with their colleagues. And then over time, they also have higher intentions to quit or higher turnover. So there are real costs for organizations when a significant proponent of the organization feels that they are not free to be their authentic selves. The second freedom that people need is the freedom to become their best selves. Uh, and I mentioned that earlier in my talk, is how can we grow and develop and self-actualize in systems and institutions that uh, are willing to bet on our potential and co-create the conditions for us to flourish and grow. You know, and some of that is saying we believe in you and we invest in, in all of the resources that you need to be able to thrive and flourish. But guess what? These other two freedoms are important within this process as well. There's a freedom to be average. It's the freedom to not have to be extraordinary, to not have to be the unicorn, to not have to be the one who hits it out of the park to dismiss or dispel any assumptions that people might have that, oh, you know, she's a woman, she only got the job because affirmative action. Um, she wore, or other, you know, incendiary comments having to work you know, so hard because your failures, the fourth freedom, can also be really damaging when you don't fit that leadership prototype when you're not a member of the in-group in the organization. You stand out more so you're more scrutinized, but people are paying more attention in that scrutiny to your weaknesses, your flaws, and your shortcomings. You're being penalized more heavily for those. Um, the Bureau of National Economic Research shows that African-American employees' failures are penalized more heavily than their counterparts, even when they have the exact same or commit the exact same failures or offenses. That's also been part of the conversations around the criminal justice system as well. 
Um, so I've examined explicitly insights from the Black experience uh, around trying to create more um, diversity, inclusion, equity, and justice within organizations. And in that research, there are a host of examples that align with the fact that people from diverse backgrounds who are not part of the dominant group, which is often white, male, cisgender, um, upper class, Protestant, um, that they are lacking access to opportunities. Uh, they're lacking the authenticity that we talked about. Uh, the access to advancement goes beyond just getting in the door around these representation and pipeline initiatives, but it's also about having managers, mentors, and sponsors who provide the quality feedback that people need to grow and develop and to be rec recommended for new opportunities within their organizations. And then around the justice factor, even when they achieve a position of leadership, they don't necessarily have the freedom to exercise the authority and hold people accountable because their leadership authority or their legitimacy is often questioned. So because they're overrepresented at the lowest levels of organizations and underrepresented at the highest levels of organizations, even when they are trying to enact leadership, they are getting a lot of resistance and pushback along those lines too. Okay, so those are the data. Where do we go from here? You know, how do we put into practice this affirm framework to create a recipe for success that addresses the fact that even if we all want the same things, because we all want freedom, we crave this, we would like to be included, we want to have these optimal experiences, but the data show that they're not, dis they're, they're not equally distributed at this point in time. Um, how can we get there? Well, I mentioned in the Affirm Framework, you know, first we have to anticipate valued contributions from differences and, and diversity. And oftentimes we are looking for the problems. Um, we are using these stigmatizing labels that suggest that people who don't look like the traditional or majority group are, um, are not there on the basis of their skills or accomplishments or strengths, but instead have been um, brought in under lowered standards, for instance. Uh, so that's already bringing a, a, a shadow of doubt that can be difficult to, to break through. So the Affirm Framework says anticipate valued contributions. And then in association with that, next, we're focusing on strengths. So focusing on strengths, what are your strengths? You know, what do you bring to the table? Okay, how do your differences help to make a difference for your organization? You know, are there some distinctive skills and ideas that you bring to your team that help to advance the work of your organization? Are there things that you do that stand out in a meaningful or significant way that are difficult to imitate or replace? Because when businesses are trying to define their uh, competitive advantage, you know, from a strategic planning uh, standpoint, they are thinking about these two things. They're thinking about the distinctive contributions that they make from a market perspective and they're also trying to figure out what they do that is difficult to imitate or replace so that they still have relevance. We can think about this in terms of our own identities as well. So when you're thinking about yourself and what you bring and you're looking across the team to look at the diversity that's present within your team, I invite you to consider identity-based resources because this is what helps us to build capacity. And there are a number of identity-based resources that we cultivate over time. We have human capital. So those are the, you know, your functional background, your professional background. Maybe you were former military and that is uh, provided you with a set of skills and experiences and perspectives that inform the way that you would live out your career and your community service, even if you retire from the military. Uh, there's psychological capital. Maybe you grew up in an impoverished background, 
or working class background within an immigrant family. And you developed a set of character traits that you carry with you that give you hope and optimism, uh, help you to have perseverance and also uh, resilience. That psychological capital is connected to your identity experiences and it help, they help you to add value. You also have your social capital. So those are your relationships, your connections, your networks. Now, incidentally, in the United States, 75%, a reported 75% of white Americans don't have a single non-white friend. We heard in our panel earlier this morning that you know part of the reason that people were really hurt about the witnessing the George Floyd murder was because they also then started to look to their right and their left and say, oh, wow, you know, what if this were my neighbor? What if this were my best friend's kids? What if this were, you know, so you can make a different kind of connection and commitment and investment when you have a more diverse portfolio and, you know, in your, in your social capital, but you got to reach hard and be intentional in building that. And when you do, it can help you, but it also helps the firm because the more diverse stakeholders or constituents you can, um, you remain engaged with, those are more relationships that you can broker. That can be access to markets, finding new clients and consumers, understanding new opportunities for innovation and so forth. So bringing those identities and diversity and social capital is incredibly valuable. And then the last is cultural capital. It's not just your dominant cultural capital, that is how you can assimilate or fit into the majority group or culture, corporate culture. But it's also thinking about what you bring to the table through diversity. So let's go back to, to the meal, to the table talk perspective. Um, when we talk about how diversity can influence or enhance our experiences at work and our leadership, we can go back to that potluck example and say, if we were having a, a wonderful meal or a fellowship, you know, what would each person literally bring to the table? And wouldn't it be a shame if we organized a huge potluck and everybody brought the same thing? So Catherine Phillips, in her seminal research, concluded after a series of experiments that diversity jolts us into cognitive action in ways that homogeneity simply does not. It promotes innovation, market awareness, it also enhances the quality of our decision-making and it enables us to attract the best talent. But diversity works when we're willing to do the work of recognizing, focusing on strengths and inviting people to the table. We also have to invite people to bring whatever they have to offer and add their secret sauce. Now by secret sauce here, we're talking about positive deviance and positive deviance, we're departing from the norm. Okay, we're not just coming in and, you know, having our differences as the visual representation, but we're also willing to step out there and offer different perspectives in our team based decisions around corporate strategy and around matters that we think um, are testing or could potentially undermine our values. Positive deviance means first and foremost, just willing to, to step out and be individual and unique and owning our combination of capital that we bring. So Simone Biles, the Olympic gymnast said, I'm not the next Usain Bolt or Michael Phelps. I'm the first Simone Biles. I mean, she looked at her unique combination of human, psychological, social, and cultural capital and said, this is who I am and this is what makes me a great gymnast. I don't need to try to emulate or become somebody else. Ursula Burns, the first and only black woman who's been a CEO of a Fortune 500 company um, and spent an, almost all of her career at Xerox, uh, had a lot of time to explore these questions of authenticity and positive deviance. And ultimately she said, I realized I was more convincing to myself and to the people who were listening when I actually said what I thought versus what I thought people wanted me to say. So there's an important element here in bringing um, diversity and inclusion that 
means we have to prepare for people to offer dissenting points of view. That needs to be baked into the culture. It needs to be psychologically safe for people to, to, um, to acknowledge their dissenting points of view, to express that openly and for people to be able to engage and learn from that kind of conversation. So in your table talk, you might consider when you witnessed some acts of positive deviance at work that have helped to promote inclusion, uh, when you've exercised positive deviance as a leader. I wanna talk a little bit about welcoming here. Um, so typical conversations about inclusion do focus a fair amount on welcoming, um, but in welcoming our guests, are we using a framework or model that is still somewhat exclusionary? In other words, are we saying, come, pull up a seat at my table and eat the food that I'll prepare for you. Listen to the menu that I'm going to prepare, uh, that, you know, listen to the music that I'm going to play for you. Are we inviting people to come in and fundamentally change what's on the menu and or what's on the playlist? So changing the substance of the work that you do, also maybe changing the climate and the atmosphere, the way in which you do it. I love that we mentioned George Washington Carver earlier and his connections to Iowa State because I, I've brought him in here as well. Um, one of the important lessons around welcoming and inclusion has to do with the consideration of special accommodations. So George Washington Carver, um, among many things, was famous for the uses of the peanut, the multitude of uses for peanuts. Um, but we are also in the age now where in early learning environments and if you're planning banquets and so forth, you know, nut free is becoming more and more popular because of the number of people who have nut allergies. So then we have to pause and use this as a, as a teachable moment. Um, there are individuals who absolutely love peanut products, peanut butter. Not only is it not harmful to them, they absolutely love it. There are other individuals for whom it is toxic. Okay, so we have to be careful in our conversations around accommodation that we don't create false equivalencies because your preference could be my poison. And it's not the same with you have to go without eating nuts, even if you don't have a nut allergy. So there are a number of different ways that we can think about how our cultures require people to assimilate and adjust um, to different roles that undermine their ability to truly be able to thrive and flourish. Uh, and so that's something else that we can talk about today. Special, account, special considerations that may be necessary. How do you know? How do you know how the non-dominant groups are experiencing themselves and experiencing your organization right now? What steps do you need to take so that you can learn more about their special needs and whatever accommodations you may need to make? I want to invite you to think about some power dynamics within your organizations. Uh, representation does not tell the story alone. Um, people of color are overrepresented at the lowest levels of organization and underrepresented at the highest levels of organization. Um, and those um, patterns are often reproduced around other dimensions of difference as well. Um, so who are the servers and who's being served? How have these distinctions been reinforced over time? And most importantly, what are the rewards of service? And when you think about what's happened this year in COVID, um, the fact that the majority of frontline healthcare workers, um, and I'm not talking about the chief medical officers, um, the hospital administrators, I'm talking about the physician's assistants, uh, the janitorial staff, the nutritional staff, um, those frontline healthcare workers are disproportionately women of color. Um, they are also members of the communities that have been affected economically and health-wise um, and from a justice perspective, you know, most adversely. So when we talked about essential workers during COVID, 
um, and sheltering in place, you know, who are we really talking about as the essential workers and what kinds of rewards are we offering them? And what are the implications for how businesses and business leaders are either countering or perpetuating societal inequality? You know, in general, when it comes to talk of, co of, of power and culture, you know, we tend to sort of remain silent. We enact these scripts around deference for the power brokers, but we don't often name the power dynamics that exist within our organizations. Um, and because of that, we don't have the opportunity. It's not just about, you know, trying to, to, to reinvent um, and to be more intentional in advancement and equity, but it's also about how if we know that we have power, we can exercise that power to lead inclusively and equitably. So using the power that we have for good. Preparing for tomorrow's meal. This is where the conversation of flipping the script comes in. Uh, flipping the script means suspending some of our assumptions about who knows the answers and who has the wisdom. And we heard some of this from the panel as well. I love the example from the Disney movie Ratatouille because in this particular movie, it is actually the rat who is the brilliant gourmet chef um, and the human whose parent was a gourmet chef uh, is the learner. The human is the one who was promoted into this position of head chef within a French restaurant without knowledge of how to cook, even though the parents could cook brilliantly. So he's carrying that stigma, these high expectations that he's not able to live up to. The rat comes in Everybody have low expectations of the rat, very negative connotations of the rat. Um, but the rat was actually the one who had the wisdom and the graciousness to work in collaboration um, out of love of cooking alone. And then ultimately, you know, was invited and, and recommended and given the status for what he was contribute, contributing. So how can you learn from members of your organization? How can you learn from leaders of other organizations? Uh, what do you have to suspend um, in terms of assumptions about expertise? Um, and these assumptions of expertise do correlate with the power dynamics that we mentioned earlier. Finally, planting and harvesting. So we don't just want to serve a meal for today. Um, and figure out how we can tap into diversity and get everybody to bring something to the table for, you know, a one time engagement. But what does it mean for us to really do this work and take it up in a way that is fundamentally building for the future, expanding our capacity to nourish, sustain and strengthen more people. So organizations and communities grow stronger. This is relational work, valuing difference. It's going to require some investments. What does investment mean? It means we're going to have to shift our priorities so that if we want to leverage the business case for diversity, we make the attendant resources um, apparent in, in so doing. You can't make a minimal investment in a business case and expect a maximal return. But unfortunately, that's what happens. Um, I've, employee resource groups are incredibly valuable for many of the, the reasons that were mentioned. Um, but when your DEI initiative is hanging on the backs or the shoulders of volunteer laborers who are doing this work um, you know, out of passion, but not getting acknowledged or rewarded for the way that the work is contributing to the firm is not going to be sustainable. Um, there's also going to be conflict. You know, when we're allowing more dissent, um, a lot flipping the script, right? That means that we have to come up with some new processes for understanding um, how to make decisions. Uh, how to engage with the creativity um, coming up and questioning marketing strategies, um, maybe having to do some rebranding. We've seen a lot of that in recent months as well. Um, and then on the moral side, there is a measure of discomfort as that we have to prepare ourselves to engage in too. So I appreciated the questions earlier about resistance. Uh, there's a moral case uh, for building equity and dignity and justice, um, but 
every, you know, everybody doesn't define those things differently or really on the equity perspective, you know, a lot of people have not yet bought into that. Um, they'd like to jump straight to the freedoms and the equality without addressing uh, the equity and inequity that exists in organizations. And we also tend to be somewhat insular. So either focusing externally um, around clients and customers because they often, you know, they've put a lot of pressure on immediately or other community stakeholders. Um, but what does it look like to affirm differences when we're considering our partnerships with other businesses? And are we internally holding ourselves accountable for doing this work of being welcoming and creating cultures. This is not a blank slate initiative, by the way. You know, you don't just start from scratch. There's always a history. That history is baked into everything that we're doing right now. We're talking decades of um, patterns of exclusion and disadvantage that led to the shocking um, disparity in rates of contraction and morbidity uh, from COVID-19 this summer. That didn't just happen overnight. You know, that was systems that created and, and reinforced those kinds of disparities. So as we think about the ways that our organizations show up in the work that we're doing, um, we have to look back, we have to look around, and then we have to look forward and plan for the future. So Again, the affirm steps, anticipating valued contributions, focusing on strengths, uh, fostering conditions for best selves to flourish, investing in strategic diversity, rewriting the script, and mobilizing resources. So I'm going to uh, stop my screen share and switch over for Q&A, please. Say, Lou. Fantastic presentation, Laura. We appreciate your insight. And uh, we have a few questions for you that I want to get asked. Um, it was brought up a couple of times to elaborate a little bit on George Washington Carver. Being in the Midwest and being 30 miles away from where he went to school, um, just a lot of insight of what his experience is like, if you want to share what his experience was like going to school at Iowa State University. I, you know, I don't know as much about George Washington Carver's experience at Iowa State. Um, I do know that he spent the majority of his career at Tuskegee Institute, um, which is an historically black college in Tuskegee, Alabama. Um, and um, Booker T. Washington was a founder of Tuskegee Institute. I heard that um, Booker T. Washington and George Washington Carver didn't always agree on lots of things, uh, which I found quite curious. Um, so you would say, well, why, were, why was he still there? Well, these are deeply segregated times. So, you know, faculty didn't have many options. Uh, W.B. Du Bois came out of Harvard is the first PhD in um, the early 1900s and then went to Clark University in Atlanta and taught, um, which was an historically black college and university at the time. So not, um, you know, I don't know as much as I mentioned about the quality of his experience at Iowa State. But when I look across history and I think about some of the other career choices that he made and ultimately how his life and career unfolded, um, I think that tells us about the kinds of opportunities that were available to him, even as the brilliant scientist that he was, um, they, were, they were quite constrained. Okay, I appreciate that. So another question I received here is, um, how does an organization know if diversity has been achieved? What wins can be celebrated along the way? And how do you affirm talent, talented majority culture, uh, people who may take a backseat as organization pursues equity? Oh, that's a two part, right? That's two part. <laughs> okay. So the first part, um, how do you know that it's been achieved? Um, so I say on that one, representation is a starting point and an ending point. Um, it's not the whole story, but it's a, it can be an important signal of what's not happening or what is happening. You know, if you look around and you see more diverse representation in senior leadership positions, 
you know, that that is an indicator that there has been movement along one of the dimensions. But I, I, I mentioned four that came out of our research and all four are important. So diversity numbers, that representation, the pipeline, that's gonna tell us about access. Um, inclusion is also important. We need to understand whether or not people uh, feel that they can bring their authentic selves to work or if they feel that they have to expend this cognitive and emotional energy in um, assimilating into the, into the workplace. If they're present physically, but their culture, the organization's culture is not hospitable to them, you're essentially serving up somebody a peanut butter sandwich every day who has a peanut allergy. You know, and over time, that's going to be destructive to them. So we got to think about the culture and whether or not the culture is truly inclusive of people who come from diverse perspectives. The third is around um, the, the question of equity when it comes to advancement. Um, are people being judged on the same standard for um, performance um, advancement as well as for penalties? Um, or, or do you see a higher rate of turnover for members of certain groups that doesn't reflect their performance, but is more about race or other dimensions of difference? Also, you can look at the other end and talk about hiring and unconscious bias, which you know several of the leaders on the panel today talked about how unconscious bias filters into org organizations, performance management, yes, but even at the point of hiring. So um, there are field studies that indicate that even subtle signals like having what one would deem an ethnic sounding name versus a name that sounds more uh, white or Caucasian American um, gives you a lower evaluation on your resume. Um, so minorities systematically whiten resumes. They might put a first initial instead of putting a whole name. They might Americanize their name um, so that they don't get immediately kicked out of consideration from a hiring pool. They might not list some of their um, affiliations, their clubs, their activities or organizations or, you know, I explicitly mentioned in my bio Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Um, lots of people have heard about Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated over the past few days or weeks that may have never heard about it. It's a historically black um, sorority. And uh, our vice president elect Kamala Harris is a member. And so there's been a lot of conversation about that. But when you have those cultural and racial affiliations, uh, people will over interpret those affiliations to say, well, hmm, I don't know if they'll be a fit. And then they'll over inflate some signals that suggest that you are more elite and you're more quote unquote mainstream and fit in, in a dominant culture. Like, oh, you played lacrosse in high school or oh, you're part of a ski club or, you know, so there, there are intersections between race and class that are playing out even in these dynamics. But again, the question is how do you know when you've gotten there or when you've arrived? It's <laughs> the representation is a starting point and the ending point, but like, those are two pieces of the sandwich. <laughs> what's in between? Like, what's the meat? It's some of these issues around inclusion and equity and justice that I mentioned. How do you persuade people um, to care about the work? I mean, that's hard. Um, I've been writing this summer about uh, three zones of action in advancing this work, um, head, hands, and heart. You know, and I, and I talked about them today, or I referenced them today. So heads, you got to acknowledge, you, you have to pre present data and compelling anecdotes um, so that people will acknowledge that this is real. You know, this is not fake news. These kinds of um, inequalities that we're talking about, that they, they're real. Uh, they've been happening for a long time and they're consequential. Um, that's no small hurdle because a lot of people, you looked at the exit polls, we're deeply divided right now. If you look at the exit polls from last week's election, I mean, the extent to which people who voted for one candidate versus the other believe that race and racism is an issue in this company, 
I mean, in this country right now and how that would also mirror in your companies, quite stark. People are deeply divided around that. The second is affirm. And that's why I use that as a basis for my framework. You know, we want to jump to action. We want to jump to the act. Okay, what can I do? Give me a million things to do. And tell me all the things that you've tried. But if you haven't done the hard work, you haven't done the hard work. So affirming is coming to terms with your own uh, assumptions that may have perpetuated inequality, right? And telling yourself, for, it's okay that I didn't know or that I made a set of choices. I can, I can commit now. I can choose to care and I can do something differently. Um, so it's building those bridges around caring that then motivate people to advocate um, and to even just from a talent management perspective to bet on somebody else's potential. Okay. Great, great response. I appreciate that. So doing this work, this all affects us all differently. Yeah. So one question we got is uh, um, interested to see how a woman of color takes care of themselves. What does self-care look like for you? Um, so self-care for me, uh, <laughs> this is probably a little different um, for a couple of reasons. I think one, because um, I tend to be all in. So it's a lot harder for me personally to turn it off because it's, it's my lived experience. It's also at the center of my professional life right now. Um, and so self-care for me had over the past several months has included writing. So I write a lot about this because it's cathartic. So I need to get it out of my head. Maybe for you, that's journaling, you know, but I think it's, it's important to get it out of your head because you can spend so much time saying like, is this real? Is this me? Was that just me? Or was this a thing? You know, am I crazy? Did this really happen? Did that person really just say that? So it's that kind of, um, you know, doubt and not being able to have the kinds of reality checks that you need can be really damaging. So journal one or write however you need to have conversation partners. That's why I'm highlighting seven conversations. I feel like there's, there's value, there's healing, there's learning, there's resistance in the talk, in the conversations. You can have a range of conversations with people. Some of them are quite frankly, draining and exhausting because they can be so polarizing. Um, but some of them can also be quite life-giving. So that's valuable for me as well. The last is um, I write a lot about positive identities. I published in a uh, Harvard Business Review article in December of 2019 as part of our Advancing Black Leaders um, Big Idea edition. It came out November, December 2019. You can get it now. They pulled it out from out of the paywall in June. Um, <clears throat> Harvard Business Review Advancing Black Leaders started that series with an article that details a lot of the research I shared today. It's called Toward, Toward Racially Just Workplaces but finished it with an article about the power of self-affirmation. And I, with my colleague, Tony Mayo, who actually wrote a case study about uh, Rosalind and her leadership at John Deere, uh, Harvard Business Review case study, Tony and I wrote this piece to close out that series about self-affirmation. And we offer different affirmations that you can give for yourself and for others, and especially for Black women at different stages of your career, because it looks differently at different stages of your career. Um, but they're all meant to help you to remain committed to the process of growing. Give yourself a little bit of grace. <laughs> you know, give yourself, for me, the freedom to be average and the freedom to fail have been super important in the past few months as well. Um, the, just, just with COVID, these are super trying times and it, it is tough work. Um, Great. That's a good answer. So I will say real quick that these slides will be available. The video is actually being recorded. So you'll have an opportunity to watch this again. Um, in the sake, sake of time, I'm going to ask one more question here. We've got a lot of good questions. So I apologize if yours didn't, um, get answered, but, you know, I'd like you to talk about, um, 
about gathering feedback from minority employees throughout these organizations um, to see if they feel included. Do you know if, uh, what companies are really good at this or have any best-in-class examples or tools when having those conversations as they could be, you know, relatively uncomfortable? They, yeah, they do tend to be relatively uncomfortable. And so say, Lou, you know, quite, quite candidly, I would say most companies have shied away. Um, you know, that was the work that I wanted to do for my doctoral dissertation. And when I started trying to get companies to let me come in and ask their employees about their experiences of feeling included uh, in the late 90s, I got more no's than I can even count <laughs> in catalog. Uh, thought I had a yes and then legal caught wind of it and got kicked out. So companies are still very skittish, uh, squeamish about doing this and about making it transparent. In fact, they haven't even been counting uh, from a representation standpoint and analyzing those data on the basis of race. So one place to start is to just look at your employee engagement survey. And most companies have them and analyze the data that you're already collecting by subgroups and see if there's some patterns and trends and differences there. Then I conduct listening circles with um, people of color and organizations and members of other marginalized groups and organizations so that I can hear more of their personal experiences. It generally aligns in some way with the research because we study a wide range of contexts, but it's important for members of the organization to get the specific examples and hear how this is playing out within their organization on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you're in an insurance company, like how are microaggressions playing out? What kinds of comments are people making about, um, you know, whether or not this is a high risk or low risk case? Um, if you're in healthcare, uh, how are people making assessments around um, patients and their their symptoms and how much pain they might be in or not? Uh, you know, there are nuances in every organization and in every industry and having those listening circles and those interviews, I often suggest bringing in a third party subject matter expert to protect confidentiality. Um, but being able to get those examples in, a, in an anonymous fashion brings it home for people and makes them care in, in a different way. Because everybody wants to say, oh, George Floyd, that was horrible, that was terrible. How could they have done that out there? But the real work happens when we start to look around and say, we're perpetuating injustices in here that are career ending and are life ending. Dr. Laura. Roberts, uh, Dr. Laura, I was thinking of Dr. Laura as your local uh, radio person. Um, but I want to thank you for your time. What amazing insights you've given us today. Um, I think we've all come out here with a list of things that we can have more discussion within our organization and more dialogue, trying to make Des Moines the best place we possibly can. So I want to thank you on behalf of all the, the audience and everyone from the Greater Des Moines Partnership and uh, um, hope you have a good day.